Thanks for the invitation. I have to say it's pretty unusual for a physician to talk to physicists, <laughs> but I hope this is going to work. Uh, so I may be either too simple or too complex, especially to use uh, words that I'm used to use every day that may have another meaning for you. So if there is something you find um, just word, weird, don't hesitate, uh, raise your hand, and uh, I will be happy to interrupt my talk and make, try to make me more simple. So I will start from pretty basic information, but then go into things that are actually ongoing research. And I, what I will do uh, is, is to tell you where we are, what we are doing in terms of gene therapy. Uh, not all of the gene therapy field. I am not a specialist of gene therapy, actually. As said, I am an immunologist interested in, in genetics of the immune system in humans. Uh, but we are using gene therapy because, as you will see, it appeared that the gene therapy is quite appropriate to treat some of the inherited diseases of the immune system. So, so this is what I will develop in my talk. Just to start with, uh, I'm these days working in that, bu that building. Some of you may know it. It's on Boulevard Montparnasse. It's the so-called Imagine Institute des Maladies Genetiques. It's an interesting place. The building has, been, uh, has opened about three years ago. It's a quite a good place to work. Uh, we are pretty happy. We have about 400 scientists working in different fields of, of genetics, both basic and, and medical genetics. All right, so just to start with very, very basic information. I guess you know these things, but just to be sure. Sorry, there has been a little bit of uh, displacement based on the um, incompatibility between Mac and PC, but I check apparently this is the only one during my talk. So as you know, uh, we, eukaryotes, we have cells with nuclei. And within the nucleus, there, there is the DNA, which is the, the molecule supporting heredity. And part of the DNA is encoding are the genes, encoding proteins. Uh, as you know, these, prote these genes are not um, uninterrupted. They are made of exons, the indeed coding sequences, but also introns, non-coding sequences. But of course, you know that the DNA is transcribed into messenger RNA. This messenger RNA is spliced. That is, the sequences corresponding to introns are deleted. And the messenger RNA goes into the cytoplasm at, at the level of ribosomes, which are the, uh, the workshops where proteins are made based on the code, I'm sure you know, of the four nucleotides, ATCG, that are pairing, and uh, the, the word of three letters, ATC, ATCG, and so on, encodes uh, the amino acids at the level of tra translation uh, of the ribosomes. An important aspect, and which is of course medically relevant, but not only, is that each time a DNA uh, is replicated when cells divide, so mitosis, but also during meiosis uh, for, for gametes, uh, many, many mistakes are made in terms of copy. So mutations are created. Could be uh, just modification of one base, but could be deletion of many of them, could be duplication. So, of course, this may harm in terms of medical consequences, inherited diseases, I will talk about. But also, <laughs> uh, I'm sure you know that, uh, remi remind you this is the basis of evolution. We are here because these events of mistakes occurred. And these are occurring despite the fact that we are very sophisticated proofreading systems that correct most of the mutations, but not all. So some of them do persist in, in, in progeny cells. Okay. So the genome, uh, our genome, the human genome, contains approximately 22,000 genes. But these two, 22 uh, genes account for approximately only 2% of the sequence of DNA. So in the past, uh, we were used to say that the rest of the DNA is just junk DNA, which is completely wrong. Most of the, of the, the non-coding sequences are actually coding RNAs, not proteins, that are involved in the regulation of gene expression. Uh, so the, the, these intergenic regions are crucial in biology, and this is quite a huge aspect of research uh, which is ongoing. And just to give you uh, an element of a quantitative element, there is an estimation that there is something like one million sequences in our genome regulating the 22,000 genes, just to give you an idea, the so-called enhancers and, and other regulatory elements. So in terms of inherited diseases, since I'm going to turn to the treatment of some of them, just a few global uh, information. So we know today, and there are probably more, 8,000 different diseases that are caused by mutations in a single gene. So the so-called monogenic inherited diseases with Mendelian inheritance based on the work of Mendel in the 19th century uh, with uh, modified peas. 
so they can have so-called recessive or dominant inheritance. Recessive inheritance means that both copies of the gene have to be mutated in order to see a phenotype, a disease, whereas dominant uh, inheritance means that a single uh, the mutations of a single mutation of a single copy of one of the two alleles is sufficient to create uh, a disorder. All of these diseases are rare, in the individually speaking, but if one adds one after the other, the patients affected with these many, many different diseases, uh, it, they are affecting a significant number of people, approximately 2 to 3 percent of the population. So there are, per se, an health, public health um, issue. Some of them, the most frequent in France these days, is sickle cell disease, a form of anemia that is affecting population of black origin essentially, but also cystic fibrosis, muscular diseases, hemophilias, primary immunodeficiencies, my field, and I will come back to this field, intellectual disabilities and many others. And of course, a very important medical aspect is that despite research over the last 50 years based on molecular biology and genetics, few of these 8,000 diseases have a curative treatment so far. Uh, a few other um, words of introduction be before starting to talk about gene therapy. Uh, I'd like to mention something which is important I should not forget because gene therapy is something, but it's not the most important application in medicine of genome engineering. What has been developed since approximately 1980 is the manufacturing of therapeutic proteins based on the transfer of their gene into various kinds of cells that are cultured in massive big reactors uh, that could be bacteria, could be insects, could be ma uh, mammal cells in order to produce proteins of therapeutic interest. And these days, uh, growth hormone for children, for instance, who have a deficiency in growth hormones who are, who are um, small for, in terms of, of they have a growth uh, development arrest, uh, can be treated, uh, clotting factors for hemophilic patients, insulin, and also in red, because this is a more recent and very significant development, the production of monoclonal antibodies, so single species of antibodies that are recognizing a given molecule that can be used for many therapeutic purposes, and this is a revolution in medicine, and really this is not a, Hype. This is really today the most important application of uh, uh, gene and genome engineering in the field of medicine. For instance, uh, the treatment of several autoimmune diseases that are pretty frequent, like polyarthritis or Crohn's disease, which is an inflammatory bowel disease, have been completely modified by the introduction of an antibody that targets a given molecule named TNF, which is a cytokine, which is important in inflammation. And even more recently, more antibodies have been developed that are modifying the immune responses to cancer. And this is changing quite significantly the treatment of diseases like lymphomas, melanomas, and other cancers. So don't forget that. This is actually more important than what I'm going to talk about, but I've not been working on this field, except a little bit on monoclonal antibodies. So what I'm going to talk about still, I would say it's zero, but it's not as important as this. This is gene therapy. The principle of gene therapy, which is obvious, introduce a gene in cells into have a medical benefit, has been, the concept has been proposed uh, a bit less than 50 years ago, actually exactly in 1972 in that paper where uh, these scientific um, geneticists, these geneticists, excuse me, in the US proposed that perhaps it would be possible to use uh, treatment with genes in order to correct a genetic defect where a mutation in a given gene is causing a disease. At that time, the tools were not available, but the concept uh, appeared so about 45 years ago. So what can we do with gene therapy? Uh, the, again, the obvious thing, which is today what has mostly been implemented so far, is to provide a normal copy of a, norm, of a gene to affected cells that are in, impaired in their function because of an inherited disease. But you can also think, depending on, on genetic diseases, to inhibit or modify the expression of a mutated gene. You can also consider, and I will talk briefly about it at the end of my talk, to fix a mutation, so to, to leave the gene intact without the mutation anymore. But also, and this is now being applied in the field of cancer, I'm not going to detail it, but if you wish so, I can answer questions about it. One can also uh, uh, synthesize genes that are not present in nature, but the function of which, the protein that will be encoded by this gene, may provide the cells with a, a relevant medical function, such, such as 
for instance, inducing a strong immune response against cancer. And there is a very, very important development of such a strategy with the so-called chimeric antigen receptors over the last few years. If you wish, at the end, I can talk about it a little bit more. So these different things can be done either to treat inherited diseases or cancer, and perhaps in the future, although this is not so obvious, uh, degenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease, or why not maybe one day Alzheimer, but this is not for today. The, the overall principle is extremely simple. You need, of course, the sequence of a gene, plus the, the material made also of DNA, which is a promoter on which the enzyme necessary to get transcription of the gene um, to occur, which is the, so you need such a sequence. But this sequence, this nucleic acid, which is negatively charged, is not going to enter spontaneously into a cell. So you need a vector in order to transport the material inside the cell so that then the gene can be uh, transcribed and, and the, the messenger RNA translated into a protein with a given function. And as you will see, up to now, most of the vectors that have been used, and the, the one we are using, are viruses for obvious reasons, since viruses are naturally able uh, to vectorize genetic material into cells. That's what they are aimed to. All right. Uh, if I go back one second, since 1972, up to now, I would say up to, the end, up to 2000, say, there has been a lot of several hundreds of clinical trials of gene therapy, mostly in the field of cancer, but also to treat inherited diseases uh, without any success. So there was a complete, almost a disaster since there were such a failure so that at that time, say, the end of the 90s, uh, it was thought that perhaps actually that strategy is not going to be useful. Um, and this is not so surprising because if you want a gene therapy to be efficient, you need to solve a certain number of bottlenecks uh, in, gross, in, in gross principle. The first one, so let's consider the vector, here is the virus, whatever it is, doesn't matter in, in here. We want the virus to enter which means that there is a, an adequate receptor at the surface of cells in order to endocytize the virus. This is not too difficult, but then you want the genetic material of uh, the, the, the virus to be delivered properly to the nucleus, because of course this is we inside the nucleus that the transcription of the therapeutic gene will occur. And here there are many obstacles. Everything, uh, the, the material can be degraded. I will not go into details. This is not that easy. And once uh, the genetic material is inside the nucleus still, so you want the, the gene to be properly expressed, so to get the messenger RNA. You want not too, less, not too, too little production and, of course, not too much. You want something which is more or less physiological in order to have an, an, uh, an effect, a medical effect, uh, without harm. And this is not that easy, actually, to uh, implement. And finally, in, at least in some of the gene therapy trials, you may face the immune response of the host. That is, the host may recognize proteins from the virus used as a vector, or even the, the therapeutic protein as being foreign because not present in the body, so that the, 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 here the uh, cells of the immune system will destroy, will kill the corrected cells, the so-called transduced cells. And this has been indeed an obstacle in some of the clinical trials in gene therapy. So if you want to be successful, and again, the, it didn't work for many years, you have to be good to, to solve problem A, B, C, and D, not only A or B or C or D, obviously. All right, the, the solutions came with the identification uh, of viruses. And in, in my field, what the, the major clue was the identification of retroviruses. So, uh, I will tell you in a second, and probably you know why they are called retroviruses. Such vi viruses were known since the early 20th century as viruses able to transform cells and cause cancer. For instance, uh, the fa famous sarcoma virus uh, causing uh, uh, sarcoma in chicken. So such retroviruses were identified cultured and then their, their, their sequence cloned and uh, their biology known. One very important aspect of the biology of retrovirus, hence their name, is that their genetic material is made of RNA, not of DNA, but the, the, the virus contains an enzyme which is a reverse transcriptase, that is, that can copy the RNA into DNA. So hence the reverse transcriptase name. At the time this was discovered in the 70s, uh, actually the, the concept was not easily accepted, but 
the guys who, who did the work, famous biologists, Temin and Baltimore, they got the Nobel Prize for the identification of the reverse transcriptase. So this is key because this from the reverse transcriptase, the RNA retrotranscribed into DNA, which is associated with some proteins, I will not go into details, is able to enter the nucleus more or less easily, depending on the retrovirus. And very importantly, for the purpose of gene therapy, this genetic material has the ability to recombine with the genome so that it will become part of the genome. So there is an integration of the genetic material of the virus into the nucleus, into the genome of the, of the infected cell. And of course, this is that property which is key for gene therapy. Of course, you have to modify the viruses. For, this is obvious. Since then, every cell you will have infected with the vector will carry in its own genome a copy of the therapeutic gene. And this is expected then that this gene will be transcribed. So the very first vectors that were used were so-called gamma retroviruses. There are many species that, are, that were identified from leukemias uh, observed in mice, not in humans. And then, very interestingly, uh, the HIV virus, everybody knows about HIV, which belongs to the class of lentiviruses, which is a subgroup of, of uh, retroviruses. HIV turned out to be excellent vectors, the most powerful vectors we have in hands today to uh, induce uh, integration of gene into cells, uh, which is important, as you will see, at least in the field of I am interested of, that is the field of the hematopoietic system, so the production of blood cells. Of course, these viruses have to be modified. I will not go into too many technical details, but of course, we can't use the wild viruses since, of course, there will be replication of the viruses and uh, harm, especially with HIV. So the principle, just in a, the, the global principle of the production of the vectors, which is here, is to use a cell in the lab in which you will introduce plasmids, so some DNA sequences, encoding the proteins of the virus, since you need them, the envelope, the reverse transcriptase, and so on, plus a given sequence that contains the therapeutic gene, plus a small sequence named C, that will enable that element to be integrated, to be encapsulated in the viral particle. And at the end of the day, this cell is able to produce viral particles that are unable to replicate. For reasons I have no time to go into details. You can produce quite a huge number of such viral particles. And those particles have, have kept the capacity of entering cells, entering the nucleus, inducing recombination with the, with, with the genome, but not uh, they have lost the property of replication. All right? So this is the principle that has been developed over the 80s and 90s that is used uh, here today. So in terms of application, for reasons I'm going to explain to you now, the very first applications were in the field of hematopoiesis. This is an oversimplified scheme explaining, showing to you the production of the different cells we have in the blood, the leukocytes, so the lymphocytes, the neutrophils, other cells that are important in immune responses, but also platelets, red cells, for instance. So all of the blood cells. As you know, all of these cells derive from a single precursor, which is a stem cell. We have a few of these stem cells in our bone marrow, uh, but the very important property, by definition, as a stem cell, is that each time such a stem cell divides, it's divided in an asymmetric manner. That is, one cell will go into a differentiation process toward these many different cells, but, and the second uh, daughter cell will remain as a stem cell. So in principle, we have a, a constant number of stem cells for all our life. But in, for the application of gene therapy, this is obviously important, since if one is able to correct, say, a genetic defect in such cells, this correction may persist for all life, which is, of course, quite interesting. So there are a number of inherited diseases, I will not go in de into details, affecting the hematopoietic system, many primary immunodeficiencies. Now we'll talk about the severe combined immunodeficiency, SCID is the English acronym, but other diseases I will mention later. Um, so what happened between 1972 and the first successful clinical trial in 1999? Uh, many things that are uh, written here. First, it was uh, the design from wild-type retroviruses of these retroviral vectors. I briefly explained to you uh, in a previous slide. We collectively 
um, understood better the stem cell biology, although we still do not understand it fully, but the stem cell biology of these hematopoietic stem cells. And in between, for many of these inherited diseases, the genes were identified. And for some of them, and this is very important for clinical medical application, the mechanisms so the pathophysiology of uh, the, the disease was understood. So these progresses over the advances in between 72 and 99 explain that uh, eventually, so about 18 years ago, gene therapy became, at least in some circumstances, as you will see, uh, successful. So there are two diseases that have been um, tackled and efficiently treated by gene therapy to start with. That are those diseases, we, I'm sorry for the names, but these are the names. That one is called skid x one and the second one here, ADA deficiency. This is again uh, a very simplified a scheme of hematopoiesis with stem cells and in yellow the different blood cells. So in skid x one you will see it in a bit more detail on the next slide, the T lymphocytes that are crucial for immune responses as well, as, well as another subset and so-called natural killer cells are absent because there is one mutation in a particular gene encoding a protein named the gamma C and in that uh, deficiency ADA which is an enzyme of metabolism, I will not go into details, actually all of the lymphocytes are missing because of this, uh, of, of this uh, deficiency. We know for many years that individuals who are born without such cells are dying within the first year of age because they are prone to all kinds of infections, bacteria, viruses, and so on. It's impossible to live for more than a few, than a few months without T lymphocytes. Uh, a treatment for such conditions has been developed almost 50 years ago. Uh, which is the replacement of the stem cells by stem cells from normal individuals who do not carry the mutation, so that it is expected that in affected individuals, the allogenic, so stem cells from someone else, will take over and produce the T lymphocytes. It works, and there are people now who have been treated more than 40 years ago and who are doing well thanks to an allogenic stem cell transplantation. You may know, I'm sure you know, that this procedure is, is commonly used to treat leukemias, for instance, but it started the very first success of uh, bone marrow or hematopoietic stem cell transplantation occurred in the field of immunodeficiency. Nevertheless, despite these major advances, uh, these transplantations are not always successful, especially if there is no donor who is matched for the uh, tissue antigens, HLA, histocompatibility histo antigens, so that some of the patients are dying or have very severe complications caused by the immunological conflict between the donor and the host. So it's satisfactory, but not entirely, which made um, uh, relevant to consider an alternative therapy as gene therapy. Um, so the question which I think is interesting to look at retrospectively is, actually how, so why made these two diseases the good candidates and were indeed were the diseases that first were corrected by gene therapy. So this was based on actually on some biological studies that had nothing to do with gene therapy, I will briefly mention. So the skid X1 condition, the X stands for the fact that the gene is on the X chromosome, so boys are affected with mothers being a, as a carrier. This is again a very simplified scheme of lymphocyte development from stem cells. Here are the NK cells, the T cells, and the B lymphocytes. Everything which is within the gray or black, I don't know, square is missing in patients who have this disease. And the disease is caused by an absence of a protein which is here in red, so-called gamma C, which stands for gamma common, which is a member of receptors at the surface of cell. This is a cell membrane in the blood, <laughs> among blood cells that are receptors for proteins named cytokines with these names, IL-2, 4, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but we know today, based on quite a number of years of work, that for instance, that very specific substance named interleukin-7, IL-7, by binding to the receptor, including the common gamma chain, is important for the very first step of T cell development, and especially driving these cells, these early lymphocyte precursors, to survive, not to die, and then to proliferate. And this function being absent, the, pa the patients have no T cells. So that's the physiology of the system and its pathophysiology. But more relevant for gene therapy, yes, is the following. Why was it a success here, where, whereas for many, many other diseases, the gene therapy failed, or is still failing today? This is for, for two reasons. Let's consider in a very, very simple way, development of T lymphocytes. So it's, everything starts again with hematopoietic stem cell. 
Some of the precursors migrate into an organ, which is the thymus, at the top of the thorax. And within the thymus, there are several steps of development which lead to the production of these T lymphocytes. And here, there are two important aspects. We know that within the thymus, the T cell precursors divide extensively. So a small number of cells, as you will see later, um, are generating huge billions of lymphocytes. And very importantly, these T cells, one differentiated, migrating into the body, in lymphoid organs, in the blood, the spleen, the gut, blah, 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 where they are involved in immune responses. They have a lifespan which is extremely long, more than 50 years. Actually, they are stem cells themselves. They can self-renew as, as far as, as needed. And this is just to give you an idea, make a comparison. Let's consider two other blood cells, two other types of blood cells, neutrophils, also important cells uh, in immune responses, their half-life is two days. So you see the difference. That is obvious to consider, and there is no need to be a specialist in gene therapy, that it will be much easier to correct a deficiency in the production of T cells and of neutrophils, because here you will need to correct very few stem cells, whereas here, if you want to, and there are such diseases where there is a defect in the production of neutrophils, you will need to correct many, many stem cells. Uh, and for platelets, another example, the, the life of platelets is eight days. So eight days, two days versus 50 years. Then, so that's part of the explanation. Then we made, yes, sorry, go ahead. So is it actually a cell that lives for 50 years or the clone that lives? The clone. But, but when you then say two days, that's a cell. Yes, but the cell is unable to replicate, okay. to divide. So uh, uh, operationally speaking, it is the same. So it's, it's exactly the same. In terms of function, it's just the same. Someone else had a question, I think. No, it occurs uh, regularly. Also, it's a good question because we, to be honest, we don't know exactly. But we know that there are multiple cycles of development. Uh, it goes down with age. So at my, my age, my capacity of producing T cells is much reduced compared to yours. But still, it's still present. So it, it, it is not one for and nothing. There are multiple steps. As long as the thymus has empty niches where the cells can migrate, the process can occur. And of course, for neutrophils and platelets, it has to go on for all life. That's for sure. Yes? No, it's a different molecule. Uh, so the, the, maybe I'm sorry I went quickly to it, but if not, I will be there for many hours. Uh, where was it? Okay, so the, the, the common gamma chain, as you can see here, is part of one, two, three, four, five, six different receptors expressed in variant variable ways at the surface of lymphocytes and other cells that are receptors for what we call cytokines that are involved in several immune responses but also in the involvement in the, excuse me, in the, in the triggering of cell differentiation, at least for T cells, NK cells, and others. And this is independent of the T cell receptor. I'm going to talk a little bit about the T cell receptor, but it's different. There was another question, I think. Yes, please. Is there any way to understand why I mean, these cells last for so long? I mean, 50 years? Ah. So, it's an Please come to work in immunology and help us. No, <laughs> but these are special, what we call now memory T cells, because usually they went through at least one cycle of activation by an antigen. We know that if we look at the profile of gene expression, uh, they have characteristics that are very similar to the profile of stem cells. So uh, armed with this capacity of self-renewal, which of course uh, is based on a specific program uh, in terms of gene expression. So actually T cells, now, do, these days can be viewed as stem cells. They are special stem cells, but it's a un, slightly unorthodox way of looking at these cells, but operationally, they are, they are stem cells, as clones, as you rightly said. So, which means the same antigen receptor, the same specificity. All right. Uh, when was that? That was done. That was done. Here I was. And then we made an observation uh, a long time ago but before starting gene therapy, which for us was crucial and led us to consider gene therapy for that disease. It was a unique observation at that time in a single patient. Sometimes the study of a single patient can be rewarding. So uh, we observed a patient who had a mutation in this gene encoding the common gamma chain. And despite that, he had T cells in his blood. 
And actually, we were able to analyze in detail the repertoire in terms of T cell receptors this time. Uh, of the T cells, they, they were um, diverse, and compared to a normal individual, he had approximately 1% of the diversity of the T cell receptors, or so the number of clones that are involved in antigen specific responses. That was determined by sequencing uh, the genes that are rearranged, so different in, in every single clone in the T cells of this child. So the only way to account for such uh, an event was to consider that by chance, um, a reversion occurred in the T cell precursor that led one, or perhaps a few, but certainly not many cells, uh, to become normal, to express the common gamma chain, to, to divide and to differentiate into T cells. So what happened in that child, who had, because of that uh, happy event, uh, only a mild immunodeficiency compared to the, the, the patients who had no T cells, actually, oops, sorry, it went too quickly. Here we are. The patient had a form of natural gene therapy not good enough to cure his disease, but at least to improve his immunodeficiency. So when we observed that, we reasoned that if the correct, the spontaneous, by chance, correction of one cell or a few cells is sufficient to provide a clinical benefit to a patient, we should be able to engineer to treat a few more cells by gene transfer into stem cells to fully correct the immunodeficiency. So that was the rationale in the 90s, now more than 20 years ago, to start and to perform gene therapy and explaining why the, the concept globally of high division rate plus long lifespan of cells, that these were the good diseases to um, uh, ask the question whether gene therapy could work indeed. So this was done. Uh, so with the idea, sorry again, uh, that actually there was some auto amplification of gene therapy because by, the concept was that by even correcting a small number of cells, and you will see that it's really a small number of cells, it will be sufficient because these cells will divide, divide excuse me, tremendously to uh, provide a complete or at least a significant um, correction of the disease. Yes? Um, it, from the slide, it seems that this occurring the thymus, are you sure? It occurs in the thymus, yes. All of that, this process occurs in the bone marrow. No, the, the, develop, the T cell development occurs in the thymus. In the, time, in the bone marrow, there are stem cells and early lymphoid progenitors that have the capacity of migrating to the thymus. And in the thymus, they find the right niche and environment to undergo many, many steps. This is only one. There are, of course, many others that give rise to T cell development. If you don't have a thymus, you don't have T cells. They seem to be winning rather than losing to the other T cells. They are winning, sorry? In the term, they are amplified, meaning <coughs> they will, the proportion will increase rather than decrease. Oh, yes, of course. But in the thymus, there are only, uh, not only, but uh, predominantly T cell precursors, nothing else. It's, a, it, it's really the organ that is uh, de um, uh, determined to provide the right environment for T cell differentiation. For many reasons, I have no time to determine. All right, so we went on to, based on, on this rationale, to develop gene therapy. This was done in mice, in cells, uh, but then in humans. So it started in 1999. This is a, a cartoon from one of the patients who has been treated, so it starts with the patient. So some bone marrow cells are harvested from his, of his bones under general anesthesia, <laughs> just to mention. Uh, and these cells are then selected in order to get the more immature cells, of course, that are the most important ones, the stem cells. They are marker at the cell surface that helps. I will not go into details. And these cells are cultured and they are infected actually at that time for three days, three different cycles of infection with a vector, uh, which is here, we'll come back to here, in order to get uh, integration of the transgene encoding the common gamma C gene into the genome of these cells. And then the cells were injected to the patient without any treatment. And the cells know they have a code that enabled them to go back to the bone marrow. Okay, so the, in slightly more details, this is the, the virus. It was a gamma retroviral vector. So a gamma retrovirus in which the gene encoding the common gamma chain was inserted. So such viral particles were infected, infecting the cells. The RNA was retrotranscribed into DNA and associated with proteins. May 
in some circumstances, it's not that simple, but being in contact so with chromosomes so that uh, integration rearrangement and integration occurs so that now the gene is part of the genome of the cell. Transcription can, can occur because there is a regulatory element from the virus, I will come back to that, the so-called long term, terminal repeat, that drives transcription, translation, expression on the surface and function. That's the idea. So we treated 10 patients at that time, and then in, in UK, in London, a couple of years afterwards, they also treated in a similar manner 10 other patients. So what we did essentially is something like that. This is the, again, in a very simplified manner, hematopoiesis of patients with this disease, SCID-X1. As you see, they got something missing here, so the T lymphocytes and the NK lymphocytes. So the idea is to introduce the here the, the blue rectangle, uh, the therapeutic gene into stem cells so that to restore development of T cells and that's easy. Of course, the blue rectangle is everywhere. Uh, in that case, it doesn't matter. It's not specifically, we cannot uh, drive the uh, integration into only T cell precursors. It's global. But for that disease, it's not a problem. For some others, it could be a problem. I will come back to that. Uh, and actually, it worked. Yes, please. Please, please. I'm sorry, I'm going pretty quickly, but uh, <laughs> that's life. Uh, in that case, there is no donor because this is the autologous bone marrow which is used. We are, in that case, this is the autologous cells from the patient that is used to be corrected. There is no donor here. Depends. Uh, here it is, yes, if you, uh, I didn't comment what is written here. Uh, that is, in patients who have an HLA match donor, usually a brother or a sister, uh, still today, it's probably better to do an allogenic transplantation than gene therapy. But for those patients who don't have such a donor, which is the majority, the chance of success, what well, depends how you calculate, uh, is, so in the first case, the chance of success is over 90%. So more than nine out of 10 patients will survive. If you don't have such a good donor, the chance of success is somewhere between five, six, or seven out of 10. But in that case, this is in that, just to finish, it, this is in, in that setting, so patients who do not have an HLA match donor, that gene therapy was proposed. Okay, so here, uh, the critical step is in the, the insertion of the vector or the proliferation of the cell that are Everything is critical. <laughs> Everything is critical. You need insertion uh, in order to get cell division. One is depending on the other. They are not independent factors. The first step is integration, so insertion of the transgene into the cell's genome. And then the expression of the molecule, the protein, will lead to cell proliferation. OK? You will see this is, that may also create problems, as you will see in a second. Okay? <coughs> All right, so this was done. And this was, sorry, this was done with uh, significant success. He, here are pulled the data from our clinical trial plus the one performed in London a couple of years ago. All, total 20 patients treated. And from, so these first trials of these 20 patients today, 18 of them are alive. And 17, this is the blue curve, so this is the survival as a function of years. Uh, are what we call disease-free, that is, they don't longer have clinical manifestations. In other words, they are able to cope with bacteria, viruses, and they enjoy a normal life. Actually, these, these individuals who are now young adults are living normally. Uh, they are studying and so on, so they, they have immune responses. And the good news is that it looks to be the, the clinical benefit is stable over time, since the very first were treated 18, a bit more than 18 years ago, and the median survival of treated patients is now 15 years. So this was quite significant. And it was significant now if we looked at the T lymphocytes that were zero, this is the number of T lymphocytes in blood. Uh, the, in between the, um, the, the, the two black lines, this is the normal values uh, in people who are more than two years of age. Uh, so you see at zero, they had zero. And they had a wave of production of T cells. And interestingly enough, so about 18 years, 15 to 18 years post gene therapy, they have a T cell counts in blood, which is normal. And uh, there are, um, so here there has been some problem, but 
doesn't matter. This is a, a way to calculate. I will not go into details unless you wish me to do it. It's a to quantify the, the number of T cells that are going out of the thymus because we can, uh, by quantitative uh, polymerase chain reaction, PCR, we can calculate cells that have a certain characteristic of being new thymic immigrants. And the interesting observation here, this is a log scale, but still that the production of newly formed T cells persists over the years. It's not only, it, it was not achieved only once uh, at the early stage after gene therapy, but still 10, 20 years later, not 20, but 15 years later, these patients have such so-called new uh, thymic immigrants. So, so far so good, uh, but this was not as good since some of these patients, five actually, had uh, serious problems that occurred between two to five years after gene therapy, so in the red oval here, which was, and this is of course quite significant, T cell leukemia, so which was fatal in one of them. And it led uh, to, obviously, despite efficacy, into the interruption of the clinical trials in 2003, with the idea to understand what was happening there, what was the cause of such a major complication. There were three, po po three possible hypotheses. Uh, could be, as, and it is the case, something related to the vector itself. But also, it was considered that perhaps there is abnormal, uh, perhaps too much of a too strong a signal delivered by the expression of the common gamma chain, that, that this was excluded. And perhaps there was something special of the biology of T cell precursors that was in the context of the disease that could have favored the uh, occurrence of leukemias. This if hypothesis two and three were uh, ruled out. But the hypothesis one, as you will see, was indeed the, the right explanation. Interestingly enough, as written here, uh, in murine models in which we tested the gene therapy, we, we had generated uh, mice in which the common gamma C gene was knocked out, we did not observe su such uh, leukemias. But of, as you may know, mice do not live for 20 years. They have a lifespan of two years maximum. So the time of observation of these mice was maximal one year to 18 months. And probably it was too short to see the events. All right. So could we have un anticipated that, that problem, which of course, retrospectively, it's an important uh, uh, to, to consider. Uh, the, it's interesting to, to, to go back a second to what was the situation where these gene therapy trials were initiated. So in 1998, the time we got authorization to initiate such a, a therapy, it was the time where the, the complete human genome sequence was not known. It came just a couple of years later. So we had no good idea on uh, how the retroviral vectors, the retroviruses, do integrate into the genome. The idea, the common idea, is that it was that it was a random process, that it could occur anywhere in the genome. Actually, as you will see, it turned out to be wrong, but we had no way to analyze it uh, at that time. So we considered, we and collectively considered that the risk that have an event that will induce uh, for activation of an oncogene, for instance, so to deregulate an, a gene that is involved in a cancer, could happen, but given the fact that the genome itself uh, the coding genome, and that, that was already known, was only a small, very small fraction of the genome. The likelihood of such an event was considered to be low. Not zero, but to be low. This was wrong. That's for sure. This was wrong because we, le we learned by uh, using uh, high throughput sequencing and targeted sequencing of the uh, integration site, so where the retroviruses have landed into the genome, we observed that actually 60% of insertions occurred within genes, plus or minus 10,000 bases. So if this is everything but random. Randomness would have been 2%. So there is a, the, the retroviruses like genes, if I may say so. And if we go even more in details, uh, this is the frequency of integration as a function of uh, the structure of the gene. Here you see there is a Gaussian distribution. And the top of the Gaussian distribution is exactly at the, at the place where uh, the transcription of the gene starts. So the, the, the first triplet from the first exon. So the, these, var these viruses like very much to insert close to the gene, just five primes, so just uh, on the left, usually, of the gene, which is in the promoter region, or within the gene itself, and very, very frequently, which means that many genes are targeted, and this may have consequences on gene expression. And it, it has, uh, in terms of now epigenetics. Uh, the, here, this is a, a distribution 
of the integration sites. Here is what is shown on, uh, on this panel is just the same. So the, the, the more red is the color here, the more frequent is the event. And this, this, what is in the red rectangle indicates that very frequently with different vectors, doesn't matter, uh, the integrations occur within genes. Interestingly enough, now if we look at epi epigenetic markers that are able to um, show uh, to look at active genes, so genes that are transcribed versus genes that are not transcribed. There are markers of histones that are proteins associated with DNA. As a function of differential methylation, we know what are the active uh, uh, part of the genome and that are those that are inactive. Now, here uh, in the, again in the red rectangle, and now this is in blue instead of red, I'm sorry, the, the more blue it is, the more stronger it is. Sorry, I'm sorry, the color legend is not the same. But all of the marks here, I don't go into details, are marks associated with active genes. So not, not only uh, the viruses like to go into genes, but they like to go into active genes. Okay? And uh, within active genes, of course, some of them uh, may be harmful if they are not properly regulated. And this is exactly what happened. So the consequences of this, uh, of this attraction, if I may call it that way, of, the, of uh, the gamma retroviruses to active genes is what is shown now. So again, this is integration somewhere in the genome. Uh, so this is the genetic material. I'm not going into the detail at the moment. And it goes into a gene. So here this is exon 1 of a given gene, whatever it is. Exon 2, first intron here, this is the promoter of the gene. And here this is an example, arbitrary example, where the genetic material landed of the virus, landed into intron 1 of that gene. Okay? So this is happening quite frequently in many genes. So far, this is not that bad. The, the bad part is that here in red or orange, I don't know, um, this is the so-called long-term long terminal repeat of the virus, which contains an enhancer activity that is able to drive the expression of a gene even at a certain distance. And actually, this enhancer activity was used to drive the expression of the therapeutic gene. But the problem here is that there has been what we call an, a, a transactivation of some genes, so the one in blue here. And if this, on, is, this gene is an oncogene, that is a gene, physiological gene, but when deregulated cause cancer, then we have an oncogene transactivation, and the transactivation of such a gene may cause the cancer. And actually, that's what happened in the patients. And of course, this is uh, something which is not acceptable. And some of oncogenes that are physiologically expressed in hematopoietic stem cells were indeed targeted, overexpressed, and caused the leukemias. So the next question is, yes, please. Why is it so rare? Well, five out of 20, I will not call that rare. And if you look, it's not 100%. That's, I guess I take your point. Uh, the proper answer is I don't know. If we look at the overall pattern of integration sites found in the many different T cells in the blood of these patients, we found many more integrations in proto-oncogenes. But some of them perhaps were not strong enough in terms of transactivation to drive, to drive the uh, uncontrolled expression of the oncogene. But strictly speaking, we do not know. It could have, indeed, it could have been worse. That's for sure. It could have been better, but it could have been. So is there a way to get rid of that problem? The answer is probably yes. So again, this is the situation observed. Insertion, say, in Entron 1, as an example, transactivation. The obvious way of getting rid of the problem is to, to remove the enhancer activity. We know the sequence that's easy. So this was done. So vectors were constructed in which the enhancer activity is deleted. Actually, the one of the three prime is copied on the five prime, so it's only necessary to do, it, to do it once. But if we want a vector to be useful, we need to add a promoter. If not, the transgene will not be expressed. So these are so-called self-inactivating vectors, SYN vectors, that have been produced over the last 10 years and now, are now used in the clinic. So for the SCID-X1, the same disease, this was done. So we have a vector where the, so the delta here indicates that the enhancer is gone. And instead, we here we have a promoter. Doesn't matter what it is. So that the gene IL-2RG is gamma C, is the same. And a, a clinical trial was performed between us in Paris and other places in the US, and which was actually successful because of a, among the 13 patients treated with a follow-up you can read, of course, it's more recent, uh, 12 of the patients are alive. One died from infection related to his disease, not 
to the gene therapy, and all others today are doing well. Uh, with a very strong clinical benefit in 10, and no toxicity, no such leukemia has occurred, at least so far. And in a more, sorry, in broader terms, the, these sin vectors, I'm sorry, there has been some modification, again, coming from the, the bad translation between Mac and PC. Anyway, the important part of the curve is here. This is the probability of being leukemia-free. So this is not 80%, it's 100%. There has been uh, some shift, unfortunately. So. Here, this is a global worldwide statistics on patients treated for SCIDEX1 as well as other diseases with such vectors where the enhancer activity of the long terminal repeat has been deleted. And you can see, not fully, unfortunately, but all of these patients, there are 44 of them, who have a follow-up of at least two years with a median follow-up of five years, a maximum of 10 years, which is now significant, and none of them has developed a leukemia which doesn't tell that the risk is over, but at least it tells us that the risk is very much diminished and is tolerable in terms, given the, the risk associated with the disease. Okay, so this is now leading to further development of, of gene therapy. But before, before that, I, I will mention these developments, but before that, I'd like to mention a few other um, findings we made about these first, uh, these first uh, gene therapy trials. Uh, the first one is to, to see indeed whether, uh, wh wh how many of these stem cells were corrected to fully reconstitute the immune system. Is it one, 1,000, 1 million, 100 millions? So it's possible to answer that question because we have the way, as I already mentioned, to analyze uh, in the periphery, in the blood, the T lymphocytes of these patients once they have been treated and looked by targeted uh, and so-called ligated mediated PCR and sequencing. We can analyze all of the, the, the integration sites and every single clone has a signature that was delivered at the time of gene therapy. And looking here at different patients, different times, of course, there is some variability. But you can see that the maximum number of different integration sites found in the genome of these patients is 1,000, or a bit more than 1,000. So it means that globally, it, it's like, it could be slightly underestimated, but doesn't matter. The, uh, this is the order of magnitude. Approximately 1,000 cells here among the precursors were transduced and were able to generate T cells, which is now a posterior, posteriori the demonstration that indeed this gene therapy works because the, the precursors divide quite extensively. This is not based on a very efficient uh, gene transfer methodology. Okay? Yes, please. So is then the diversity of the actual T cells? That comes, that is on the next slide. <laughs> Obviously, the next question, what about diversity? Because if all of the cells will have the same, uh, the same T cell receptor, it won't be very useful for the patient to have a monoclonal population. So this was analyzed. And uh, just to remind those of you who are not uh, experts, I guess, most, I'm sorry to say that, <laughs> in T-cell differentiation. During the process of timic differentiation, there is not only cell division, but also somatic rearrangements of the genes encoding the T-cell receptor. There are two subunits uh, for the most frequent form of T-cell receptor, the so-called alpha-beta T-cell receptor, so that every single clone is different. Of course, it's an image. There are many more than what is uh, shown here. So every single uh, T-cell has a distinct T-cell receptor required for antigen recognition. So what about patients? Do we observe that picture? So a diverse repertoire or not? Um, sorry, just to, re to remind you, in the thymus, there are steps of cell division, these steps of somatic arrangements of cells, which occurs in several steps. I'm not going into the details. But this is a key step in thymic development of T cells. So what about the patient? That would be the worst scenario. Almost all of the cells are the, are the same because a single precursor generated all of the cells. And this is the good scenario. The answer, the good scenario works in most of them. So what was done is the sequencing of the T cell receptors of the polyclonal T, well, of the T cells of the blood. And these are the figures of one, for one of the two genes, the, beta, the gene encoding, the so-called beta chain, and compared to healthy individuals of, of adults and uh, adults here and young individuals who are younger actually than the patients. Uh, in all of them, with one exception, who was one of the patients who had leukemia, the, num the estimated number of different chains is comparable to controls. So the answer is that indeed, 
more or less what, this, what has been generated is a diverse repertoire, which is, of course, what was expected to get efficacy and control of infections. That was not a surprise since clinically it was observed that these individuals are healthy. They are cope with infections and they develop antigen specific responses. All right, so that, I think that was interesting to consider. Meanwhile, a few years later, the second immunodeficiency, ADA deficiency, was treated. Uh, but I will not go into too many details, but uh, interestingly enough, here there are uh, here 31 patients who were successfully treated between 2002 and 2013 in Italy, US, and UK, and another 32 more recently, so a total more than 60 patients, which is encouraging. Uh, there are more details here, but I will not take too much time. So from that, I would like to conclude the first things that are kind of proof of principle of efficacy was provided in, that's very important, in a favorable setting based on this capacity of auto-amplification of corrected cells. Okay? But interestingly enough, the benefit has been now, is now sustained for more than 18 years. Um, the safety was an issue, and it's very likely improved by the this second generation of vectors where the enhancer activity has been removed. And in the case of ADA deficiency, some chemotherapy was given, which is even improving the, the quality. So based on these results, obviously, uh, everyone in the field was considering to treat more diseases, of course. And this was done very briefly uh, for one given disease, with, which, which was named up to now Wiscott aldrich syndrome, which is another form of immunodeficiency where lymphocytes don't work properly, but are present. But the patients have infections and autoimmunity, and they are dying from bad infections or autoimmunity. And in addition, they have a problem with platelets. So they are bleeding, as you can see here. This is what we call purpura, so subcutaneous bleeding, which is a problem, major problem in these patients. So the gene was identified. The pathophysiology was understood. The protein is named WASP, as a, according to the name of the disease. And this is a protein involved in the regulation of the cytoskeleton, the actin, which is forming the cytoskeleton of cells. So uh, um, a vector was produced, which is in that case a lentiviral vector based on HIV, so which is, uh, which is much more potent to transduce stem cells. So it was expected to correct many more cells than in the case of skin. And also chemotherapy was given to the patients in order to empty the bone marrow to increase the chance that the corrected cells will uh, go into the right niche and develop into uh, blood cells. And in that case, the vector was even uh, more sophisticated because the endogenous promoter of the virus, of the virus, of the WASP gene was used to drive the expression of the gene. So this was done with some success. For instance, we are colleagues in London. We have treated, it's not yet many, but seven patients. And the clinical benefit has been observed in six. They are doing well. This is the score of the disease. Five is worst. Zero is perfect. So to go from down from 4.7 to 0.3 is pretty good. This is follow-up. And this, no toxicity was observed. So this is one advance. And to all together, uh, in, in between the places where this trials occur, so uh, take place in US, uh, Italy, and France. There has been today, with these so-called SYN vectors, uh, 67 patients treated. And interestingly, 62 out of 67 are doing well and have an immune system, which is not bad and encouraging for the future. With a follow-up, which is not, I'm sorry, so the, there is more problems with the incompatibility <laughs> between MAC and, and um, and uh, PC, the lines are not aligned properly, but you can read that the median follow-up is somewhere between two and a half and four and a half years. So what, uh, based on, on this, there are perspectives to treat more in immun inherited immunodeficiencies. I will not go into details. There are more than 50 diseases to consider. So it's a quite a lot of work, potentially, in, just in the field of T cell immunodeficiencies. But then we may think to go one step further. And the step further is to consider diseases, still inherited diseases, for which gene transfer does not confer autoamplification. That is, the fact that the, gene, the, the normal copy of the gene will be introduced is not going to have any effect on cell survival and cell proliferation. Just modify the, the cell function. And, and also to consider to treat diseases affecting cells with a very short lifespan as, as neutrophils, as I told you. If you want to do that, you need to have a very efficient way of correcting stem cells and to have many of these stem cells corrected. Is it achievable today? The answer is yes, actually, as you will see. It started 10 years ago uh, with, is, uh, in a study we did with 
Paris and colleagues, Nathalie Cartier and Patrick Aubourg, for a given disease, I will not go into the detail, which is adrenal leukodystrophy. This is the first time actually a lentiviral vector was used to transduce hematopoietic stem cells. And what is interesting here, this is the first patient treated, time up to 10 years. And interestingly, 10 years after gene therapy, there are still in red neutrophils, in blue or purple monocytes, or the cells with a rather short lifespan, that are corrected, approximately 10%, which is not much, but the fact to have, say, 9 to 10% of such cells with a very short lifespan, neutrophils two days, I remind you, uh, still carrying the transgene, demonstrate, I'm sorry, demonstrate that real stem cells were transduced. That was the very first evidence that it is indeed possible to achieve stem cell transduction with the, the differentiation into neutrophils. So 10% is perhaps enough for that disease, is enough for so some others, not enough from, again, other diseases. So it's, a, it's, uh, it's an advance, but it's not absolutely sufficient to consider all genetic diseases of the hematopoietic system. But still, we have made more progresses, more advances, technically speaking, so that, for instance, today, I will briefly mention that to you now, we are treating another immunodeficiency, which is named chronic granulomatous disease, diseases because there are several genes affected. This is a disease where the killing of bacteria and fungi by neutrophils and macrophages is impaired because the genetic defects leads to a defective production of radical oxygen species in phagolysosomes, that is, in vacuoles in which bacteria have been engulfed, phagocytized by neutrophils. So this is leading all of our life uh, to bad infections, and one sooner or later, uh, these patients are dying from, from such infections. So this is an image of a, of a neutrophil phagocytosing a bacteria itself dividing. And in, in the vacuoles, there is, uh, on the membrane, there is enzyme, an enzyme, NADPH oxidase, which is defective in that disease, which is involved in the production of the reactive oxygen species. So a vector has been designed, again, a lentiviral vector, providing one of the genes, CYBB, doesn't matter what it is, involved um, in the disease. And there is an ongoing trial that is performed, again, at an international level between London, Los Angeles, and Paris. And for instance, we have treated a patient nine months ago. And nine months later, this guy who is doing well has half of these neutrophils in the blood that have a normal production of reactive oxygen species. So which means nine months is not 10 years, but given the lifespan of these cells, two days, so they are uh, renewed every two days, so you can calculate how many cells were produced. So it very, this is strongly suggestive that indeed stem cells have been corrected, and perhaps half of the pool of stem cells today in the patient is corrected, which is very encouraging for the future and further applications. And the last potential application, which is even one step further in terms of difficulty, is to leave the field of uh, immune diseases and to go to hemoglobin disorders that are much more frequent diseases, like beta thalassemia and sickle cell diseases. These are inherited diseases where the gene encoding the beta chain of hemoglobin, and you know what is hemoglobin and how important it is for the transport of oxygen. So these patients uh, have a, an anom abnormality in the beta chain of hemoglobin, and because of that, and in several ways, they have severe anemias that are impairing uh, very much their life. So here, potentially, these disorders can be treated by gene therapy. But here, there is a major difficulty. That is, up to now, what I've mentioned is our settings in which we have introduced the gene into stem cells, and the gene is potentially expressed in all kinds of blood cells, whatever they are, red cells, white cells. For many proteins, it doesn't matter. It's not toxic. But for the beta chain of hemoglobin, that would be a problem. If we would have this beta chain of hemoglobin expressed in leukocytes, this will kill the leukocytes. So we need to have a system which is more sophisticated in which the, the beta-globin encoding gene is only expressed in the cells that are uh, producing the red cells, what we call the erythropoietic lineage. So to that, uh, vectors were produced in which not only the gene was inserted, but also what so-called locus control regions, that are genetic elements that regulate the expression of the gene so that it will be expressed only in the erythro erythrocytic lineage. 
So the first trials have been initiated, and you may have heard because there has been a recent publication by my colleague Marina Cavazzana at Necker in collaboration with Philippe Le Boulch, who is at CEA fontenay sur rose who, who made such vectors. And the very first patient with sickle cell disease, one year after gene therapy, has now half of his hemoglobin, which is normal. And this guy is doing well, does not require um, transfusion anymore. It's only one year, only one patient, so it has to be very, very, very cautious about the results, but this is, of course, very encouraging. So we are mastering better and better this, this technology. To finish with, if I, do we have still five minutes? Maybe no. Hmm? Two. I will be quickly to the very last step. What we have done up to now is gene addition. So we have a cell with a mutation in a gene, very simplified way of showing it. Of course, usually there are two alleles, only one is shown here. And we are using a vector with a virus that is introducing a normal copy, which lands somewhere in the genome, but not at the right place, and leading to the expression of the protein. This is fine for some of the diseases, but this is not physiological, since the gene is not in its right environment. For some of the genes, again, it doesn't matter. For, for others who are very strictly regulated, let's consider insulin, for instance. The, the G, insulin gene is very, very tightly regulated. If you put an insulin gene anywhere in the genome, it's not going to, to work properly. So is there a way to do better? Uh, the way to do better potentially is genome editing. That is, instead of adding a gene, it will be to use enzymes that are specific nucleases that are, will cut the DNA at a specific place. So you, ha you have to guide the, the nucleus to go at the right place, to cut, and then to provide, this is on the right-hand side of this slide, to provide a matrix of recombination so that you fix the mutation by homologous recombination. Are there tools for do doing, for do to do that? The answer is yes. Uh, the first tools that were derived over the last 10 years, there are essentially two. There is a third one that are the so-called zinc finger nucleases and the talon, which are engineer where we have nucleases able to cup the DNA, coupled to a protein which has been engineered to recognize a certain sequence of DNA. So it's a code behind it, but not a code easy to, to play with. But some of the, the, sequ the sequences of DNA can be targeted in order to have a, a very precise and specific cut. Uh, but these, the design of such constructs is pretty cumbersome, and it doesn't work for many places of the genome. And as you know very well, I'm sorry, um, uh, the, the emergence of the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which is mass, much easier to work with, because instead of having a protein to, to guide the, the, en the enzyme Cas9 to cut the DNA. Now this is an RNA complementary to the DNA, which is very easy to make, that is guiding the enzyme to cut at a precise place. So as you know very well, I'm sure this the system is used now in all laboratories in biology in the world to modify genomes of cells, animals, plants, whatever. Is it applicable to gene therapy? That's the next question. So this is CRISPR-Cas9. In, in orange, this is the enzyme. There are two sides of, of cuts with, with the scissors here. And the, 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 this is the complementary sequence, which is guiding the, the enzyme to, uh, to the given place in the DNA. So what we aim to do instead of gene addition is, gene, uh, is fixa fixating um, a mutation by uh, providing to the, to the cell two things. The engineer nuclease. There are several ways for doing it plus a small, short strand of DNA for recombination so that at the end, you will get a cell with a normal gene at the right place, which is perfect, of course. Does it work? Well, it, it works in vitro. It works in many models. But there are two problems that are not fully solved today. The first one is how many cells do you correct? And today, especially in stem cells that are not dividing much, the number of cells that can be corrected is too low for clinical application because the system to work properly needs homologous recombination, which is a very specific system to get um, uh, recombination of the DNA. And this works only in cells that are dividing. So this is a major limitation of the system. And the second problem is that despite the specificity of the enzyme because of the guided RNA or guided protein, there may be off targets that is modification of genome elsewhere, and that this modification may, why not, drive a cancer. So because of these two issues, especially the first one, this has not been used yet uh, in vivo for clinical trials. This may come, but maybe not as soon as may have, may, uh, and one may have anticipated based on uh, the hype and the hope on, on CRISPR-Cas9 system. 
So to conclude, and then I'm finished, uh, this went very close, very small, I don't know why. <coughs> so today, from the start of, of gene therapy with cells for which the success was based on auto-amplification, uh, we can extend the treatment to more diseases uh, based on a very, now we have a highly efficient way of, of, of gene transfer into hematopoietic stem cells. Um, it's important to monitor these patients for a long time, 20 years, 50 years, which ethically speaking, uh, may be a problem uh, for safety. Uh, this is also interesting because it provides interesting information, for instance, about the number of clones involved in lymphopoiesis. Um, I'm sorry again, I did it correctly. Um, today, there is one gene therapy product that is approved as a drug, so the very first one for ADA deficiency. Uh, there may be, uh, sorry again, there were some problems here, alternative technology of uh, based on engineered nucleases and gene repair is a possibility, but not yet at hand in clinical medical application. It could be that cell engineering, production of stem cells uh, ad libitum in vitro in the future might be a way to, 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 to make progress. Uh, we'll see. So that's it. And if I can go to the last slide, but it doesn't want to go to the last slide. Yes, here it is. Again, some with some confusion. I'm sorry about that. Just to mention a few names of people involved. This kind of work needs a lot of people. Uh, clinicians, of course, but people who know about gene therapy, people who know about immunology, people who know about uh, genetics, and so on and so on. So the, I'm not going to review all of the people. Just to mention the two, first two, the names uh, of whom are in blue, uh, Marina Cavazzana and Salima Asenbe Abina, who have been working with me over the last 20 years or so who have been involved in everything. So they have done everything, from the, the uh, development of the first uh, viruses, the, their uh, assays in vitro, and then the monitoring of patients with the help of, of many other people, and the collaboration of people. Uh, this is, as you saw, very strongly based on international collaboration with people in, in England, in the US, uh, and also I have to mention the collaboration with the Geneton, which is that structure developed by the AFM Teleton, where they are able to produce uh, batches of vectors that can we use in the clinic, so which is of course very important. Okay, thank you very much. In your introduction, yes. if I'm correct, you mentioned cancer. Treatment. Yes, I, uh, I, you did not mention in your talk. Could you make a, ma yes. a few comments? Here it is. Uh, oh yes, sorry. Um, so indeed, to these days there has been in several places in the world, mostly in the U.S., people. What people have done is to use T cells, the cell in blue on the left-hand side, from the patient with a cancer, in which they introduced a chimeric gene, so-called encoding the CAR chimeric antigen receptor, which is uh, encoding a gene with a recognition unit here, able to recognize a molecule at the surface of a tumor cell. And this is linked uh, to protein, a part of a polypeptide, that is inducing activation of the T cell. So it's an artificial T cell receptor. And this artificial T cell receptor will drive the T cell to be activated by the tumor cell and to kill it. The difficulty is, uh, this is what to recognize at the surface of tumors, because most of the s molecules that are expressed at the surface of tumor cells are normal molecules. And it's very difficult to find a cancer-specific molecule. So actually today, there hasn't been any success with cancer-specific molecules. What has been done is to focus on tumor cells where uh, the con physiological counterpart is not absolutely critical for life. And there is one given example, which are cancers of B lymphocytes. The B lymphocytes are cells that produce immunoglobulins. So if you, kill, if you don't have any B lymphocytes in your body, you will not be able to make immunoglobulins, but this can be provided by blood products. So this therapeutic has been used to treat cancer of B lymphocytes, B cell leukemia, B cell lymphomas, with some successes. Actually, actually I talked with yesterday with a specialist about that. In a given trial in the US about B cell acute leukemia, by using that technology associated with other treatments, there are up to now 95%, 95% of survival after two to three years, which is remarkable. This is quite toxic because DT lymphocytes, once they are re-injected, of course this is done ex vivo, 
the T cells are transduced with the same technology we were using, we are still using for bone marrow cells, and then the T lymphocytes are re-injected to the patients. These T lymphocytes, once activated, they are extremely potent at uh, re re releasing a huge number of in pro-inflammatory proteins. So sometimes they are toxic uh, issues, even leading to death in a few cases, but the efficacy is remarkable. So the next step, the next challenge will be to design something related to that technology that will be able not only to kill B lymphocytes, but other cells like, I don't know, tumor cells from the brain. That will be difficult, but not impossible. And then one can even make some advances now by removing some molecules of the T cells so that we have a universal, as shown here, uh, anti-tumor T cell that can be used not from the patient for himself, but for one given cell line of T cells for everyone. So and we call them T cells on the shelf and to be used as a drug. And that might be possible by removing expression of some genes so that the T cell is no longer recognized by the immune system. And the technology I briefly discussed of the CRISPR-Cas9 can be used, and that would be pretty efficient, to uh, inactivate genes in these T cells. And this has already been done uh, in the treatment for two patients of patients with leukemia. So that's very interesting for the future. Okay, so I think we can thank again. Sure, sure.